Ladies and gentlemen, the matter of People versus Purse House, I thoroughly apologize to you. We had a sentencing this morning. We was, uh, it got started early uh, before you got here, and it just it took a long time. We had this courtroom filled with, with family members and other people and so forth, and I couldn't hurry them along, and I apologize to you. It involved three defendants, so it took some time. I didn't think it would take that long, so I'm sorry for making you wait. All right, and, but we are prepared to go forward in this matter. Uh, counsel, you may call your next witness. People call. We're uh, getting a witness right now, Your Honor. Who is it? This is going to be the custodian of records for Verizon. All right. Melissa Sandoval. Thank you. All right, Ms. Sandoval, if you can approach the witness stand down here, please. Um, if you could raise your right hand. I'm going to give it a crack here. Uh, do you solemnly swear that the testimony that you're about to give in the case now pending before this court should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So I hope you got it. I do. Okay, who needs my clerk? You know, I could do this just as easy. <laughs> uh, you can take, the, uh, take your uh, seat there, please. If you could uh, state your first and last name, spelling both for the record. Thank you. Melissa Sandoval, M E L I S S A S A N D O V A L. Okay, Ms. Sandoval, if you could lean into the microphone because you kind of have a light voice, if you would, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, counsel. Yes, uh, Ms. Sandoval, please tell the jury what it is that you do for a living. Uh, good morning. Um, I, I work for Verizon Wireless. I am a senior analyst with the executive relations team. What is a senior analyst? Uh, so my duties as a senior analyst include appearing as a custodian of records. I also handle small claims litigation, arbitrations, and agency and executive disputes. And as a custodian of records for Verizon, uh, what kind of training experience have you received to conduct the duties of a custodian of records? Uh, so we go through training with our Verizon security assistance team. Uh, we partner and shadow uh, other members of that team. We also have trainings uh, periodically throughout the year to ensure that we keep our skill set up. And then we deal with these records on a daily basis. So are you able to, like for example, if, if someone were to issue a subpoena, whether it's uh, prosecution, defense, or civil attorney, uh, if they issue a subpoena for phone records, are you then able to retrieve the phone records from Verizon and send them those, those records to that individual? Uh, that's correct. Our Verizon security assistance team actually handles the production, and then our team handles the appearance portion of the request. And did, you, did your company receive a search warrant for records for uh, an Amy Harwick's phone number, phone number 626-347-7623, on or about February 1st, 2021? Yes, we did. And pursuant to that search warrant, uh, did Verizon provide records related to that phone number on or about February 4th, 2021, about three days later? Yes, we did. And have you reviewed those records that were provided by Verizon to the Los Angeles Police Department? I have. How recently have you reviewed those records? I reviewed them again this morning. Okay. And would you authenticate those as records that were kept in the custody of Verizon? Yes. And were they kept in the normal course of business? Yes. And how are they safeguarded, or, or where are they stored within Verizon? Uh, they're stored electronically. The records are pulled from our switch, and they're used primarily for billing purposes and troubleshooting. And are these records generated, for example, if someone makes a call, a record will be generated, and Verizon will keep that record? Yes. And are these records reliable? Yes, they are. And did you provide the records for Amy Harwick's phone that I just indicated to LAPD? Yes, we did. And did you verify that that number, 626-347-7623, that the subscriber for that number was Amy Harwick? Yes, I did. And was the search date uh, that was requested from January 1st, 2020 to February, to February 15, 2020? Yes, it was. So whatever Verizon had as far as records for that, that search, those search dates, that was provided to Los Angeles Police Department? Yes, it was. And is that provided via email in a zip file? Uh, typically, that would be how it was presented.
And if someone has Amy Harwick's cell phone number would, and they have a subpoena to subpoena these records, are you, would you only provide them to law enforcement or would you also provide them to civil attorneys and defense attorneys also? Uh, they would be provided to those attorneys as well, as long as they followed the proper procedure. Thank you. I have nothing further. Good morning. Good morning. Do you have the records in front of you? I do not. Um, do you know whether the records that received showed any calls in February 2020? Uh, there were calls uh, on in 2020 that I reviewed. And was there anything in January of 2020? Uh, we did not have the 20, January 2020 information for call records. You didn't have that? Uh, not at the time the request was made. Those records had been purged. So whatever uh, records of those calls in January 2020 had been purged and no longer existed? As far as the call detail records, yes. There would be calls reflected on a billing statement, uh, but not the actual call detail records. And did the record, the record request you received asked for the uh, call detail records? That's correct. Um, do you know whether the Verizon records show only VO LTE, voice over LTE, as opposed to not traditional voice calls made over the cell network? I'm not sure I understand the question. Do you mean Volte versus 3G records? Yes. 3G versus 4G? Yes. Uh, we have 3G and 4G record information. All right. Did those records include anything other than the Volt key records? I believe the there was a file labeled 3G. I can't recall specifically what was on that file, but uh, the records request would have included any type of call detail records regardless of whether they were 3G or 4G. All right, thank you. I have nothing further. Will you direct? I have nothing further. All right, you may step down. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Do you right. recall Detective Scott Masterson? All right. <coughs> Detective, just a reminder, you're under oath still? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Are we ready? Thank you. Uh, Detective Masterson, I believe we left off, we talked about the statue with the broken arm, correct? Yes. You know, I have another series of photographs, A through D, would this be Mark People's next in order? Good. 83, I believe. 83, thank you. You can hear at People's 83. See that there? Yes. Is that the back of the statue? Uh, next to uh, a wooden fence. Yes. And look at that photograph. B, is that uh, also another photograph of the back of the statue and that wooden fence? Yes. And there appears to be like a photo ID number 10 over there. Yes. Is that on actually on a chain link fence? Yes. Looking at photograph C, uh, does that show port ID number 10, the wood fence and where the uh, chain link fence begins? Yes. Okay. And did you direct someone to swap that particular location? Yes, I did. Why did you do that? Because I believe that the um, defendant made entrance and climbed over that fence. And so I wanted to swap it for DNA. 
Uh, oh, so you thought maybe someone touched it with their hand when they jumped over? Correct, climbed over, yes. Well, what if, if they were wearing gloves, to your, in your experience, would that leave DNA? Injection Relevance Foundation. Oh, oh. You know, it's, it's probably, it's less likely, but prob could, there's a possibility from handling the gloves there could be touched DNA. Uh, looking at photograph D, is this a picture of the swab for that part of the chain link fence? Yes. Now, I want to get to the next photograph. Now, you mentioned that the log, there were two logs started uh, for that particular location. Is that correct? Yes. And we discussed one log that started at about 5 a.m., <coughs> correct? Yes. Is that the interior crime scene log? That's the, ex the there's an exterior and an interior crime okay. scene log, two logs. So is that for the interior log? Yes. Okay, and then is there in a, uh, a perimeter exterior crime scene log? Yes. Okay, and is that one started at 1.25 in the morning? Yeah, at 1.25, 1.27 a.m., yes. Okay. And so why do they have different times? The exterior logs at 1.25 and the interior ones at 5 a.m.? So the exterior log basically covers in this case, the outside of the house. Um, and that log was started earlier at 127. Uh, once it was determined that this was a homicide scene, they started the exterior log at 127, I believe it was, uh, with the first units that arrived uh, to the 911 call. Objection Foundation. In terms of the first units arriving? In, in terms of why they were creating this law. He wasn't there until five. What, uh, are you for, well, get into that by oh, now. Well, are you familiar with these crime scene logs? Yes, I am. How often do you use these crime scene logs? At every crime scene. Okay. Uh, uh, go ahead. So why are these crime scene logs created this way? Okay, and then, then we have what we call, that we refer to as the interior crime scene, and that's going to be even more restrictive. We're not going to just let officers go through. We want to um, keep it as pristine as possible. So we started, they started an interior crime scene log uh, at about 0500, um, corresponding to about the same time that I arrived. And prior to 0500, uh, is it your understanding the officers don't know exactly what has occurred yet? Exactly, they don't, they don't know um, if this is going to be a homicide scene, the, the victim is transported, so everything's kind of uh, in limbo for, for a little bit. And you said you start having photographs taken of various items that you think they may or may not be relevant to the particular case. Correct. Now, I have another series of photographs showing an iron uh, cast pan. <coughs> this you want people's next in order. 84. 84, photograph A and B. Uh, can you tell us what is shown here on 84? Yes, just to the right of the photo ID placard number 11, there is a, a black, I believe it's a cast iron skillet or pan. Let me show you a, a photograph B of this exhibit. Is that a close up of that? Yes, it is. All right, and going back to A, and that has a property item number 31? Yes. And is that the item number, was that item booked as item 31? Yes. And so this uh, cast iron skillet pan, uh, where would, do you know where it was found? Yes, I do. Where was that? Objection mm -hmm. relevance. I'm sorry, relevance? So this piece of evidence. Okay. Well, that's, that's my point. Uh, I want to know where it was found and, and the reason why they photographed it. Okay, good. So why was this photographed? So it, it was located at the next door neighbor's house. The owner of the property pointed it out to me. That's what you're saying. Overruled because he undertook some action in terms of securing that. Once he pointed it out to you, I take it you, you then took it into your possession? Yes. Okay, a rule. So, so what did he say to you that made you want to take that cast iron skillet into, into your possession? Objection here is that. A rule. He said it wasn't his. He didn't know where that came from. And so uh, then you decided based on that, you, you, just to be safe, you'll collect it. Correct. It would be easier to take it and not need it and then later on find out that it played a role in the, in the investigation and I didn't have it.
Donc il a des photographes showing where appears to be French storage from the interior, mais si vous people's number 85. Yes. Can you tell us what is shown there? So this is in the interior of the residence, the French doors that open up on into the living room. And you can see the, the bottom of the um, door on the left from this perspective. The bottom of the door and window glass has been broken out. Okay. Do you know why in some photographs it appears like it hasn't been broken out and on this one it appears broken out? I, I don't. I couldn't tell you why. You don't know if someone moved it in a certain way? It, it possibly it was the moved and the glass continued to fall. The pieces fell off of it because it was broken. I have another series of photo, two photographs showing uh, close-ups of photo ID numbers 12 and 14. May this be marked as people's 86. Yes. Looking at people's 86. Is that a close-up of photo ID numbers 12 and 14? Yes. And looking at photograph B, is that uh, a close-up of photo ID 12 on the French doors? Yes. And what did you see there that day uh, as far as photo ID number 12? There's a uh, red stain on the uh, wood, the white painted Objection. wood. He said it's a red stain. That's a speculation. That it's a stain. It's, how do you know it's a stain? What well, do you want him to call it? A mark, a smudge? It's, he's got to characterize it somehow. All right. Over. What did it appear to you? Well, you've seen blood before on, on, at different locations. Yes. Would you say, when investigating uh, hundreds of homicides, you've seen blood at crime scenes? Yes. And what did this appear to you to be? Uh, photo ID number twelve. To me, it looked like dried blood. And did you have a criminalist swab it? Yes. And was this? Did, did you see him? Did you see that criminalist saw it? Yes, I did. And did you have that criminalist uh, uh, identify that item as property item number two? Item 12. Photo ID 12. No, the photo ID number 12. Yes. But what's the property ID? Oh, number? the property, I'm sorry, the property, property number, item number. number two. jury what you observed as far as how that, that uh, what appeared to you to be a blood stain was swabbed. How the criminalist swabbed yes. it? Yes. Um, they used the same type of method where they, they have a um, cotton swab but when it's a dried stain the, they will use um, some purified water to moisten the tip and then rub it onto the to the stain, and thereby collect a portion of the stain, and then they'll package it, and it'll be booked and processed. And is that what you're objecting? Right, there's an objection. Yes. Hearsay foundation. Okay. Uh, how do you know that that's what they did, sir? I was there and I watched them do it. Okay, my rule. Thank you. Looking at people, uh, another. Series of photographs, three photographs of A through C, and they just be marked as people's number 87. 87. Uh, looking here at 87, uh, does this show the French doors and part of the living room with a placard over to the left? Yes. Right, let's look at 87B. Does that show photo ID placard number 13 on the living room floor? Yes. Close to the French doors? Yes. Looking at photograph C, is that a close-up of what was what you were trying to identify in photo ID 13? Yes, just yes. right in front of the, the placard. And why did you have them take a photograph of, of this location? The, this was, a, again, another uh, red stain that was on the floor that um, I wanted to document. And did you have criminalists swab this particular stain? Yes. And did they do it in the same way you described them doing uh, photo ID number 12? 
Yes, the exact same process. And was this book into evidence as item, as property item number three for this case? Yes, it was. I have a document with two photographs from A and B. May this be marked people's next in order, 88? 88, that's right. Looking at 88A, does that show the French doors from the interior side of the living room? Yes, it does. And does it show the general location of photo ID placard number 14? Yes, it does. Looking at 88B, can you tell us, this appears to be a close-up of the photo ID placard number 14. Can you tell us what is shown here? Yes, again, this is a red stain on the door just to the right of the uh, photo ID number 14. And did you have a criminalist uh, swab this particular stain? Yes, I did. And why did you ask him to swab this stain? Again, I, be I believed it was uh, possible blood. And did they swab it in the same way you described uh, that they swabbed the stain from photo ID number 12? Yes. Same exact way? Same exact way. And was this uh, swab for, for this particular case is item number four. Yes. I have another series of photographs showing what appears to be a blue room with closets and, and a carpet. May this be marked as people's necks in order. It's uh, photographs A through D. 89, 89. 89. Thank you. Looking at 89A, can you tell us what is shown here? This is the upstairs room of the residence. Um, I think technically it was a bedroom, but there wasn't a bed. It was a large screen TV and a couch. So I kind of was calling it a TV room. Or a okay. and, uh, can you describe what's over here? Uh, a little bit to the left, top center uh, of this photograph. I'm pointing it with my finger. There appears to be a door in front of it. Yeah, I believe that's a closet. How about to the left of that? There appears to be some kind of other door. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe there are two doors, one on top of the other. Yes. Can you describe what that is? That was. I, I would refer to it as a uh, built-in cabin that had like accordion doors up uh, up on top and below, and that's the wall where the TV was. And do you see what's shown towards the bottom of this photograph? Uh, appears to be a black? Yes. Some type of clothing? Yes, there's a black leather jacket. Taking that photograph B of this exhibit, does that show a different angle of that particular jacket? Yes, that would be um, the perspective of looking into that into that room and you can see the closet door on the right and then those accordion doors on the cabinet and then the very back of the photograph is a, a wall of windows that overlook the front of the house. And, are you, and how are these uh, photo ID placards being placed? Are you placing them or is, a, is someone else placing them at your direction? The, the criminalist is placing them at my direction. Um, it's a, a team effort um, we're trying to do it methodically and and not skip over things. Looking at photograph C, is this a close-up of that jacket? Yes. And looking at photograph D, is that a photograph of the jacket taken at a different location now, uh, the jacket being shown the, like the front of the jacket? Yes. And was this jacket booked in... Uh, for this case as item, property item number 32? Yes, it was. In that same room, did you find some jewelry on the floor? Yes. And I have a series of, uh, my next exhibit is a series of photographs A through D. May this be my people's next in order, number 90? Yes. Looking at 90, can you tell us what is shown there? Yes, this is a piece of jewelry um, that was made of beads and a cross, and it uh, was broken and on the floor 
in that blue room. Looking at photograph B, is this a photograph showing the general location of that cross uh, with rosary within that blue room? Yes. Looking at photograph C, uh, does this show a close-up of the cross with some of the beads that are attached to the cross? Yes, and some of the beads that are attached to the uh, necklace, and then there's some loose beads as well. And looking at photograph D, is this a photograph taken at a different location of photo ID number 16, that cross and beads? Yes. And was this cross and beads booked into evidence as property item number 33? Yes, it was. For this particular case? Yes. A through D for what appears to be photo ID number 17. May this be marked as People's 91? Yes. Looking at People's 91, can you tell us what is shown there? So this is a photograph that's taken at the top of the stairs. Um, there's a landing and uh, straight, straight ahead is the room that we were just discussing, the blue room, TV room. And to the left is a doorway that would enter into a bathroom. Looking at photograph B, can you tell us what is shown here? Um, this is again the uh, landing at the top of the stairs. The blue room is to the right, the bathroom to the left, and the photo ID number 17 in the background. And photograph C, is this a close up of, of the placard for uh, photo ID number 17? Yes. And why did, why did you have then place a placard here? A um, couple of things that are in this photograph. Number one, you can see the broken beads from the necklace that have kind of uh, continued from that blue room out onto the landing. And then also you can see in this picture um, some kind of substance residue on the floor. And could you uh, smell uh, or detect what that substance may have been? Yes. Detection foundation. Well, again, he said what it might have been. He didn't say conclusively. You can't conclusively state what it was, can you? When this photograph was taken? Yes. Uh, no, but I had a pretty good idea. Okay, so, so, so you believe it to be something? Yes. Okay, I'll allow it as such. Okay. Well, what did you believe it was? I, I believed it was urine, and based on the smell. And uh, about, can you describe the dimensions of this stain, of, of what you believe was urine? Uh, I would I would say it was uh, if I were to draw a circle around the the area, it would probably be about a three foot diameter. Did you uh, have them uh, swab this particular location? Yes. And was that swab booked into evidence also? Yes. Sir. I don't think I, I don't believe I have a picture of the swab. Uh, but is this a close-up of photo ID number 17 on, on D? Yes, it is. But you did have it swapped? Yes. And the swap was booked into evidence? Yes. Was, was something found on the balcony of the bedroom on the third floor? Yes. Well, I have a series of photographs showing photo ID number 18 with this remark. 92. 92, thank you. But what do you got, A through, a through what? A through C. Can you tell us what is shown there? So this is um, in the balcony that is located off of the main bedroom on the third level. Uh, and there was a syringe on the balcony floor. Looking at photograph B, is this a photograph of that syringe photo ID number 18 uh, from a view of looking from within the bedroom looking out towards the balcony? Yes. And uh, about how much time, uh, do you know Ron, what time this photograph is being taken? I, I don't know exactly what time it was. It was, it was quite a bit after the 5 a.m. of my arrival. 
Because it appears to be, uh, well, at least there's daylight on this photograph. Yes. Is this all, are these all these photographs being taken on February 15, 2020? Yes. And is this photograph C of this exhibit, uh, is, that, is that a close up of the syringe as where it was found? Yes. And was this booked into evidence as property item number 21 for this case? Yes. Do you have a property report with you? I do. Uh, the swab of the urine, was that booked as property item number 34 and described as a swab used to collect unknown stain hallway floor for yeah. ID 17? Objection found it. What's the, what's the I don't understand the foundation <coughs> part. Booked. Who booked it? No, I say, was it booked? Was it booked? That's what's the uh, question. That, that's us, item 34. Was it booked as, as 34? How do you know it was booked that way, sir? Yeah, I reviewed the property report. Okay. Looking at another series of photographs. It's two photographs, ministry marks, people's X in order. 93 A and B. 93. Looking at 93 A, does that show the French doors uh, from that third floor bedroom leading into uh, that you would have to use to go towards the balcony. Yes. <coughs> and looking at photograph B, a close-up of photo ID number 19, why, why was the photograph of this location taken? Uh, we had located on the doorknob another red stain. And that's a we. Okay. Uh, I. You did, okay. So you located the swab. Did you have a criminalist swab that location? Yes. And did they do that in your presence? Yes. And did they do it in the same way they did for photo ID number 12, the swabs uh, on the French doors in the living room? Yes. And was that swab booked into evidence? Yes, it was. And was the swab booked as property item number? Go back to 93A showing photo ID number 19. Was that item uh, described as a swab used to collect red stain from doorknob of French stores located in the victim's second story bedroom uh, identified as property item number five? Yes. And I'm just going to write in your presence PI5 at the very top of this photo. What's Okay. Now going back to 94, photograph A, can you tell us what is shown here? Uh, I would characterize this as um, uh, a makeup station inside the bedroom, the main bedroom. And looking at photograph B, uh, why was a photograph of this day? Uh, just to document the um, condition of the um, makeup table um, and then I was thought that there might have been uh, some type of fingerprint on the glass. These photographs were taken by the criminalists? 
By the photographer. By the photographer, I'm sorry. And looking at photograph C, it tells what is shown here. This is the swab. And was that was that the swab of that location uh, by where that makeup was located? Yes. And you thought maybe there would be fingerprints there? I thought there might be some fingerprints on the glass, and so uh, I made the decision to have that glass swabbed and then check for fingerprints. So the swab is for DNA? Correct. And then later after, so you first you take a swab for the DNA, and then you have people uh, do some other kind of testing for fingerprints? Correct. Is that, is, is that what was done in this case? Yes. And the swab, for purposes of DNA, uh, shown on photo ID number 20, was that booked into evidence as item number 36? Yes. And some of these locations, uh, once again, you're having them photographed because you don't know if it's relevant or not to the case. Objection uh, reading. Well, I think you, you stated that before, is that correct? Yes. You took a picture of every, everything you came across mostly because you didn't know whether it was relevant to the case or not. Correct. All right, a lot. Looking at 95, uh, I'm sorry, maybe I have a series of two four. You're 96 yeah. now. That'll be 96, right? 96. Mm -hmm. I have, I have 95, 95, is it 91? I have 94 with three photos. Right. Okay, so is this 95? 95. Okay. I think I was right. You're right, you're right, it's 95. 95, looking at 95A, can you tell us what it's shown here? So this is a picture from inside the main bedroom's walk-in closet. Um, this is uh, on drawers or cabinets and shelves area in the closet. And the, um, as you can see, the, the bottom drawer is pulled open. So we didn't know if it had been disturbed. Um, so we, so I had it marked and photographed. Looking at photograph 90. Uh, 95B was a swab uh, also taken from that location. Yes. And was that booked in uh, property item number 37? Yes. Now going back to the bedroom, I have a series of photographs A through C in this remark, people's number 96. Yes. Looking at people's 96, photo ID number it shows photo ID numbers 22 and 23. Can you tell the jury what is shown here? So this is the um, main bedroom of the house. Uh, this would be on the right side toward the foot of the bed. Uh, I saw on the floor and on this rug uh, some stains. And so I had those areas uh, numbered and photographed. Yes. And looking at photograph B, is this one of those swabs of that location, a photo ID number 22? Yes. And was that booked into evidence as property item number 39? Yes. <clears throat> looking at photograph C, is that a swab for the location of shown on photo ID number 23? Yes. And was that booked as property item number 40? Number 40, yes. Photograph showing the bed in this remark as people's 97. Yes. Looking at 97, is that a photograph of the bed on the third floor? Yes, it is. And is that uh, the condition of the bed uh, when you were when you got there? Yes, it was. A series of two photographs showing the purse on the floor, and this reminds people 98. Yes. And in 98, photograph A, does that show an individual uh, who appears that they're wearing gloves and looking into a black purse? Yes. And is this happening in the bedroom? Yes, it is. 
That's the bedroom with the bed that we just saw. Yeah, the main bedroom, yes. And looking at photograph B, can you tell us what is shown here? So the detective that was in the previous photograph uh, has removed some of the contents of the purse and has laid it out for a photograph. And there appears to be a notebook, gloves, and some other items. Uh, were all the contents of that purse booked into evidence? Yes, I believe so. We're going to photograph of a bathroom. We just remarked people's number 99. Yes. Tell us what's shown here. This is the upstairs bathroom. Okay, is this the condition it was in? When I was there, yes, that's the way it looked. Okay. Now, a few days later, about three days later, on February 18th, 2020, did you and other detectives go back there to take certain measurements of that balcony? Yes. I think here are a series of photographs, two photographs showing what appears to be the railing to a balcony with this remark, people's 100 A and B. Yes. <coughs> Can you tell us what is shown there? So this is a, a photograph of the balcony off of the main bedroom. This is uh, like if you're standing in the bedroom you're, and you're facing the balcony, uh, you'd be facing towards the backyard. Yes, you'd be looking out toward the uh, backyard and kind of to the, to the left. And looking at photograph B, can you tell the jury what is shown there? This is another picture taken of the uh, balcony upstairs off of the main bedroom. Um, and looking out, and that's kind of the view of the back of the house. And two other photographs showing a view of looking from the top of the balcony, looking down uh, to the pad, the, the concrete patio. And this remark people's number one, 101, A and B. Right. Looking at 101A, you tell the jury what is shown here. Yes, so we're. This is a photograph taken from the balcony and you know looking straight down off the balcony down to the ground. Looking at photograph B. It's the same type of photograph, but it's kind of turned to the left a little bit. You can see the corner of the balcony. Have another two photographs showing uh, the main Showing the balcony, may this remark people's uh, number 102 A and B? Yes. Can you tell the jury what is shown here? So this is, uh, again, the, the upstairs main bedroom balcony. Um, and this time it's looking to the, to the right. Um, so you can see the neighbor's roof line in the background. And then there's a tape measure that's laid on the balcony floor that basically runs from the um, metal railing to the um, doorway. So you're taking measure, measurements of the dimensions of this balcony? Yes. Looking at photograph uh, B of this exhibit, is this also a photograph showing the balcony and measurements you're taking? Yes. If the prior picture would uh, be considered the width of the balcony. This is a, a measurement of basically the length of the balcony. And you take measurements of the height of that balcony railing. Yes. Looking, I have a two photographs, Your Honor, showing balcony balcony railing. With this we mark 103 A and B. Yes. All right. Looking at 103. Who's the gentleman with the shorter hair on this photograph? <laughs> that would be me. Pre-retirement. Uh, and so did you uh, did you measure the height of that balcony railing? Yes. And is that what you're doing here on photograph 103A? Yes. And looking at photograph B, Can 
and tell the jury what was the what was the height of that of that railing? Uh, three feet five inches to the very top lip of the of the uh, railing. So it was over, it was over three feet. Yes. Now, in this particular case, uh, did you request that syringe that we observed as property item number 21? Did you request for that item to be analyzed, the liquid within that syringe? Yes, I did. All right. And did you first send it to the LAPD lab? Yes, I did. And what happened with that analysis? Uh, the report came back that it was uh, not a narcotic. And did you, try to did you try to continue to try to see if you could determine what was in that, uh, what, what that liquid... Uh, the, what was the liquid in the syringe? Yes. And what did you do? Uh, after I was told that uh, the LAPD lab would be unable to do that, um, I then uh, contacted an FBI agent that I that the, the department works with and um, looked into having the FBI test it. And did you send property item number 21 to the FBI to be tested to determine what was in that syringe? Yes. Okay. And did you obtain results? Yes. And were those results that it was nicotine? Yes. And when did the FBI return the syringe and two vials uh, when they returned it back to you? Yes. So when those when it returned back to you, this started off as uh, property item number twenty one. What's the process when you when you have the items returned from another agency? They've been opened by another agency and now they're being returned to you. What do you do with that? So the LAPD policy is that once an item is no longer within our control, um, when it comes back, when we get it back, in this case the FBI lab, I rebook it into LAPD property, but we no longer consider it item 21, the previous item. It is now going to be booked in as a new item number because it was out of our control for a time. And was that rebooked as item number 65 when you got it back? Yes. Now, a syringe found at the defendant's residence, uh, was that also sent to the FBI? Yes. The foundation. Well, well I'll that first. Uh, and uh, just briefly, if you would, so we'll call yes. you back in in just a few minutes. And you are calling uh, who? Brief with us. Detective Fretlord. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, you would normally take a break at 11 because I brought you in late. Unless you guys need a break. Anybody need a break? Okay. Okay, the restrooms are back here if you need to go. All right. All right. I haven't talked to him yet, Your Honor, about the... Uh, oh, yeah, okay. We'll, we'll get it straightened out. All right. A detective, right? Yes, sir. Okay, if you can approach the witness stand, please. Raise your right hand. <coughs> you solemnly state that the testimony you're about to give and the solemn not pending before this court should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. I do. Thank you. Have a seat. Please state and spell both your first and last name. It's uh, Herman Fretlor. Herman is spelled H-E-R-M-A-N. Fretlor, F-R-E-T-T-L-O-H-R. All right. Counsel. Thank you, Robert. Uh, what is your occupation assignment? I am a uh, homicide detective for the Los Angeles Police Department. And how long have you been a sworn peace officer? For 29 years. 
Now, on February 15th, um, 2020, were you at the location of 8148 Cabora Drive in the city of Playa del Rey? Yes. Why were you there on that date and time? Uh, we were serving a search warrant, and I was one of the uh, searching officers. And was that at around 7.30 p.m.? Yes. Now, during that search, uh, did you find any items that you recovered? Yes. And what items were those? Uh, there was a computer that was in a cabinet on the west wall of the uh, living room. And was that booked in as item number 16? Yes. And this was in the kitchen at the location of the address I just mentioned? I'm sorry, what was the last question? This uh, computer was located in the kitchen of the address I just mentioned on Cobora? No, it was in the living room. I'm sorry, my, I, I apologize. The living room? Yes. Okay. Now, did you book that into evidence as item number 16 under DR number 200606? Two two zero. Uh, Detective Vinton did. But you were the person that actually recovered that computer. I I pulled it out of the wall and I gave it to him and he booked it. Now. Um, you, you pulled it out of the wall and then you gave it to him. Yes. What's the what's the speculation? Then he booked it. Detective Vinton. Booked were you there when he booked it? No. Okay, so you handed it to him. You handed it to him. Yes, I did. Okay, we'll, we'll take it from that. I'll we'll, we'll, we'll sustain that. Okay, Are you strike that? Yes. Was uh, Detective Vinton with you during a search of this location? Yes. Was he the detective responsible for booking all of the items that was recovered from that location? Yes. And one of the items that was recovered was, in fact, that computer. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, uh, did you also speak to somebody by the name of Angel Lee on February 15th of that date? Yes. And where is it that you spoke to her? Uh, we spoke in our uh, police vehicle, giving her a ride home. And who's we? Uh, Detective Vinton and I. And you were giving her a ride home, you said? Yes. And that conversation as you were driving was recorded? It was. Now, when you spoke to her, did you talk to her about um, what she did with someone by the name of Gareth Pursehouse um, in the hours prior to you taking her home? Yes. And during that conversation, did you ask her in regards to whether she observed any injuries on Gareth Purse house? I did not. And who asked her? Detective Vinton did. Were you present when he asked her? Yes. Did you hear her response? Yes. And what was her response? She said she saw him with a black eye. Your Honor, at this time, the people have a CD and may that be marked as people's next in order? You are 104. You said it's a CD? Yes, Your Honor. All right. <coughs> and the accompanying transcript, which should be 104. Dave? Yes. Yeah. approach for one with the for the court? Yes. Can I get one please? Yes. Now that everybody has a copy, I'm going to play a small snippet. It's only a few seconds. Right? Did he have the same clothes on that he had on when he got stopped at the police? 
Now, did you hear the um, entirety of that recording, Detective? I did. Now, after um, Angelique provides to you that she observed that the defendant had a black eye, could you understand what it is that she said thereafter? Not, not in this recording because it was very, her voice was very light on it, but I did listen to the entirety of this interview earlier today, and I did make it out, yes. Okay, and what is it that she said immediately after saying that she observed the defendant had a black eye? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the last part of uh, Detective Bradmore's answer. Can, can, can you read it back, please? <clears throat> answer, no, not in this recording because it was very, her voice was very light on it. But I did listen to the entirety of this interview earlier today, and I did make it out, yes. So I'm going to object to the uh, detective telling us something he heard on a, a recording that is not of the same quality being played before this jury. Is it? Is it the same recording that you're listening that we're listening to now that you heard it? Yes, Ron. Well. I This recording speaks for itself. Well, I don't know that he knows it's the same recording because he says it, he says it is. Sir, he said it was a better. Well, then let me take the witness on board there, please, because then I can understand. Go ahead. Thank you. So, Detective Fretlor, um, today you said before coming to court, you were provided with a recording to listen to. Yes. And it was a recording provided to you by who? By uh, the counsel here. And we're prosecution. Okay. The same attorney who's questioning you? Yes. Okay. And when you were listening to that, where were you? In my office, at my computer, with my headphones. So something was emailed to you? Yes. And you listened with headphones? Yes. And um, did you prepare any notes of that? No. Did you provide anything to the prosecution this morning telling them that you listened to this recording today and had reached a determination as to what you heard? I did. You know what I mean? We approach. Did, did, was that made orally or in writing? Uh, it was an email. It was an email? It was an email you sent? Yes. Yes, okay. You indicated that you received a video file or an audio file from the deputy district attorney in your office at e via email. Yes. And that you listened to it with headphones. I did. And then after you listened to it with headphones, you sent an email to the deputy district attorney telling her what you heard. I sent her an email inquiring about listening to a portion of the email that that uh, they were inquiring about regarding the black eye and that I had listened to it and then I asked her if 
be anticipated asking any additional questions regarding the statement. And did you tell the Deputy District Attorney that you heard what did you tell the Deputy District Attorney in that email what you heard on that audio recording? I'd have to look at the email. I don't, I don't do you I have it with you? I do. Could Go you ahead. take a look? Thank you, Your Honor. No, I just asked her if um, that I listened to the uh, part regarding the black eye, and I was asking if they anticipated any other questions regarding that, regarding the statement. When did you tell Deputy District Attorney Marino that you heard whatever it is you're going to say you heard? When did you report to the Deputy District Attorney what your impressions were of what you heard on that audio recording? In the he just, he, he just stated, no, well, he just stated that he, that's what you provided, that's the extent of it, is that correct? Yes. You didn't state anything further, because earlier, uh, I was under the impression, I think counsel was as, as well, that when you listen to the recording with the earphones, you could make out what it said. Correct. And that you then relayed that or conveyed it to, to the DA. Yes. But you did not. I'm looking the, at your email. Not in the email. No. When okay. did you? In the hallway. What, here? Outside of court? Yes. Today? Yes. May we approach? Yeah, you did that orally? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, people, you're still on course of, of, of resting on Monday, you think? Uh, Monday, early Tuesday. Okay. All right. Good. All right, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Without telling us how, what you were able to specifically hear on your own independent hearing of, of this recording outside of... Well, I haven't heard the question. I, I, it's, it's testifying. It's not a question. It's, it's assuming facts, not in evidence, that this witness heard something. Well, I mean, so he stated he had. Well, and the, court stated, the court stated that the, the, the tape speaks for itself. It's not on the tape. The tape speaks for itself. So he, she, he, she's basically admonishing him without telling, advising us what he may have heard. Well, finish your question. Thank you, Your Honor. Without telling us what it is that you heard when you independently listened to this recording with your headphones in your office with better quality, um, are you able to determine whether or not, based on your hearing today in court, whether Angelie stated that she did not ask the defendant how she received her black eye? I'm, I'm sorry, uh, his black received, eye. How he received his black eye. What's your objection? Objection that calls for speculation. Now, how is he supposed to know what he heard before he listened to the recording? Well, I mean, do you have any independent recollection as you're sitting there talking to Miss as, is Angelina? Angelie. Angelie. Do you have any independent recollect, recollection regarding that issue? Without having listened to the recording, no. Okay, it stands like that. So, go ahead, go forward. Based upon your review of the report and the recording, do you remember whether or not Angelie disclosed to you how the victim, I'm sorry, how the defendant received his black eye. No. Okay, I'll accept that. Okay, yeah, okay, the answer is no. You want to accept that? Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. Did you or Detective Vinton follow up with Angelie and ask her specifically whether she asked the defendant how he received that black eye? No. So no question Follow-up question was posed to Angelie after she revealed to you and Detective Vinton that he received the black eye. Correct. Thank you. Nothing further. Anything? Very briefly. Yes, go ahead. Detective Vinton, 
Detective Brettler, um, how long have you been a detective? Since 2006, 17 years. And how many homicide investigations have you investigated? Personally, 72, and I've been involved in probably 300. And were you the original detective who called out Detective Masterson uh, to the property at 2086 Mount Street on the evening of this event in 2020? Yes, I was. I was yes, I was on call. And um, you also were called out to 2086 Mound, and you were one of the uh, investigators on this case. Is that correct? I was the uh, supervisor on the case. So you were supervising this case? Y yes. And in that capacity, did you sign as supervisor approving the closeout report prepared by Detective <coughs> Masterson in this case? Would you refresh your recollection? Most to likely you? I did, but if I can look at May it. May I approach you? Yes. Yes, I do. Okay. And while I'm here, may I just ask a follow-up question? Um, yes. I'm going to ask you to review page 200, and, well, it's 8, 283, but it's uh, page 4 of 8 of this report. And the last paragraph, if you For, for what purpose? Is. Recollection recall? Uh, what is it, refreshed? Or what, what? Yes, to refresh his recollection what? regarding uh, the interview of Angelique. I'd object to yeah, I, I don't think it's officially established with the foundation. Is. Okay. Well, you want to hold question? it and I'll ask a question. Okay. So, Detective Fretlor, um, you approved of, you're still reading. <laughs> I am. Okay. I think they want me to ask you a question. Sure, first. go ahead. Okay. So, you approved uh, of the report containing a summary of uh, your and Detective Vinton's interview of Angelique, is that correct? Yes. And so before you reviewed this, re before you signed this uh, closeout report, you reviewed it, is that correct? Yes. And then as part of your review, you would have reviewed that last paragraph that I pointed out to you on that page four, is that correct? Yes. Okay, uh, does that paragraph accurately reflect what occurred when you spoke with uh, Angelique and Detective Vinton on February 15th, 2020? I'm sure it's correct. It was three years and seven months ago. All right. And does does that refresh your recollection as to what was said? It does. And like I said earlier, the recording I listened to earlier this morning as well. Okay. Well, based on this report, Angeli never told you or Detective Vinton that she asked or, or that, let me rephrase that. Angelie never told you or Detective Vinton that she asked Mr. Pursehouse how he got the black eye. She did not know how he had the black eye. And she had reported to Detective Vinton and to you that she did not ask him how he received the black eye. Is that correct? I believe is she did not know. May I approach? Yes. Thank you. Did you review Detective Vinton's report pertaining to the interview of Angelique? I did. When you reviewed the report prepared by Detective Vinton, did you ask him to make any corrections to the report? I did not. Did you believe that his report was accurate when you reviewed it? Yes. Would it refresh your recollection to look at the report in regards to whether or not uh, Angeli asked Mr. Pursehouse how he got the injury? Okay. Did you ask and answer? Sustained. I believe he's already answered him. I believe his last answer was that she had not asked, that she... Um, and if that, if that, what you're about to show him, shows something to the contrary, then I agree with you. 
She did not ask. Right. It, that's what the report says. Okay. Would you agree with that? That's what, what's written, Your Honor, but I think... Ob objection. Okay, no, go ahead. You can but, answer. But specifically, she said she didn't know. She, but did she ask? She, the only thing she said regarding the, the black guy was she didn't know. Okay, but she never said, I never asked. She, she never said that. Okay. Right. So, it, if... What was that again? She never, she never said that. She said she didn't know how he got the inner injury. No, regarding asking him, I think. That's that's the quandary here, right? I mean, well, you're, you're I asking I whether she asked him or sorry, whether she knew. I understood that uh, maybe I'm confused or a little, little unclear. That you that she never asked. She did not know how he got the injury. Number one, Is right? That correct. Yes. Okay, and she never asked him how he got the injury. She never said that. She never said that. That the subject never came up. Yeah, that's possibly okay. an interpretation of what she said. Okay. I'm going to call. I move to strike that last part as speculation. We've heard testimony from All Detective right, Vinton insane. yesterday. Go ahead. I'm going to. Okay. And and your Honor. Hold and I'm trying to. Have a sidebar. I would like to be able to ask the question okay. about the report. So I understand. They have a right to post sidebar. Like you, you all do. Out some confusion. So, Detective Fretlor, you had an opportunity to read Detective Vin. Okay. We're going to try to clear out some confusion. So, Detective Fretlor, you had an opportunity to read Detective Vinton's report. Yes. And you did not ask him to make any corrections at the time that you reviewed it. That's correct. And that is because you did not find any inaccuracies in that report, correct? That's correct. All right. Do you need to have your, your <coughs> recollection no. refresh as to what this report actually says? No, I read it. All right. And the report does actually say that Angeline noticed Purse House had a black eye but did not ask him what happened, correct? That's what it says, yes. Thank you. Nothing further. Any regret? Yes. <clears throat> the report that Kalis is referring to, who wrote it? Detective Vinton. Now, you indicated that it was a summary of the interview, is that correct? Yes. Even though you signed off on that report, whose interpretation of the conversation with Angelie is that? Your interpretation? Or Detective Vinton's interpretation. Objection calls okay. for speculation. Oh, 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 oh. Detective Vinton. Okay. Now, based upon hearing the recording today, reviewing the report that Detective Vinton wrote, do you believe the statement to be inaccurate? Objection, Your Honor. Well, he's already stated that he believed he 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 was asked specifically about that paragraph by counsel just a few moments ago, and he said he believed it was accurate. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And when you say you believe it was accurate, do you believe it was an accurate interpretation by Detective Vinton? Overruled. It is. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further. Okay. All right. Anything further? You may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. Oh, oh. See, you should have gotten away. Let's try and try. All right. Do you have another question? Yeah. I'm going to ask one last question, Your Honor. Um, I'm going to approach with this report. May I see this report? Is it the same one you showed? Yes. Okay. The paragraph you showed. Uh, I showed two reports. We showed. Good. And I'm going to point to you. Mean, you can't read it from there? <laughs> <laughs> Take a look at it. Okay, let's let see. So okay. No, I can't. Thank you. Okay. So here. Your Honor, may we approach? So it says, uh -huh. Your Honor, that's the second time today. No. I'm sorry. I'm going to check the counsel testifying a second time. All right. 
listen, this approaching business is, the court is going to get intervene and it's going to deny uh, approaching. I'll allow it this time around. Let's approach one more time. May I reapproach a witness, please? Yes. Okay. Are you highlighting portion of the statement? Yes. Now, there is a statement in regards that is in contention about whether or not Miss Angeli was asked, or Miss Angeli asked the defendant whether she asked how the defendant got the black guy. That's that, correct. Is that correct? Now, based upon the review of the report as well as the recording, did she state that? That okay. She did not ask. And, and that subject has been broached, and this witness has already answered to the best of your ability. Is that correct? The, you, yes, Your Honor. Okay, so let's move on from there. Can you it, just it answer is, the question? That's the only question that people have. No, I know it was the only question. It's been asked, posed three times. I'm going to. You don't have to answer that. So let's move on, if you would. All right? Well, now, based upon the report of Detective Vinton, do you agree with the statement that he stated he did not ask him? She did not ask him what happened. We object to this cause for speculation and uh, beyond the scope and ask an answer. Overruled. No, I do not agree with that statement. Thank you. Nothing. Okay. No, I'm going to object and move to strike it because of the reasons we broached at sidebar. Um, because uh, overruled. It will stand. So that's for argument, counsel. All right. Let's let's move on. Anything further? No, Your Honor. All right. You may step down, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> While we're getting that with us, let's have a All right. All right, uh, counsel. Uh, who's qu who's questioning? I, I okay, go ahead. I'm going to play a tape for you right now. How long is the tape? No, I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want to have another photograph showing uh, defendant purse house? It's a DMV photograph. Would this be mark the people's next in order? One oh five. One oh five. <laughs> Do you recognize? Oh, you recognize this document? I do. Okay. So, uh, at some point on February 15, 2020, did you receive information uh, from individuals that led you uh, to want to arrest Garrett Persons? Okay. Yes. You're saying overruled? Yes. I mean, based on the information you received, did you un did you undertake subsequent conduct? Yes. Okay. Overruled. And was one of that was part of that conduct to obtain his DMV photo. Yes. And is this document uh, his DMV photo with his DMV information? Yes, it is. And on his DMV information, you have a fingerprint a signature that's shown on People's One Hundred Five. Yes. And do you have an address? Yes. And is that 8148 Cavora Drive, Playa del Rey? Yes, it is. And does it also have his height and weight? It does. And is that height of 6'4 and weight of 230 pounds? Yes. And is the issue date for this on July 3rd, 2019? Yes. And was this photograph used to provide to other detectives if they were to uh, arrest the defendant, they would know what to look for? Objection leading the state. What was the photograph uh, going to be used for? 
and used to help identify the suspect. Now, we were talking also about uh, how you sent items to the FBI to be analyzed, the syringe, property item number 21, and when they send it back, I don't know if you finished uh, describing, when, when they send it back after they've opened the syringe and they send it back to you, what do you do with it? Once, we get, once I've received it back, then I have to uh, repackage and rebook it, but under a new item number since it had been out of our custody, our care and control. So it's no longer property item number 21? Correct. Did it become property item number 65? Exactly. Yes. Rule out on that foundation. Yes. Okay. Looking here at photographs A through H showing uh, number 65. Uh, may this be my people's next in order number 106? Yes. All right. Is this, uh, do you recognize what's shown here on photograph A? Yes, I do. And what is that? So this is a analyzed evidence uh, envelope. It's uh, marked uh, number 65, has the uh, name Harwick Amy. It also has uh, my name and my serial number. Okay, and just uh, for the jury's edification, the numbers written here, 106, PI 21, and A, those, those I've written those. Those, are not, those were not part of the photograph, correct? Correct, yeah, that's not me. And looking here at photograph B, uh, does this show what's inside uh, the envelope for the envelope that was marked 65? Yes. And it also shows another envelope in there with a 21? Yes. Okay, and it shows something in a, in a, like, a, like a test tube. Is that correct? Yes, it has a, uh, a tube with a stopper on it so it won't okay. fall out. And photograph C, is that a close-up of that? Yes. And photograph D, is that a close-up showing some markings on that glass cylinder? Yes. Including photo ID number 18? Yes. And that's the photo ID when you see the syringe out in the balcony? Yes. And photo E is another photograph with a ruler next to it? Yes. And what's the purpose of that? Just gives you a scale a measure of what it is, how big it is. So when you're looking at it in the in the photograph, you have some kind of idea of the size. Yeah. In photograph F, that's another close-up with markings on the tube. Yes. Including uh, the DR number two zero zero six zero six two two zero. Yes. That's your case number. Yes, it is. Photograph G is just another close-up. Yes, it is. In photograph H, is is this one of the vials that was returned to you? Uh, from Dr. Brown, when, after Dr. Bradley analyzed the syringe and created uh, a smaller vial. Is it is. Oh, uh, huh? It is. Indeed. And that's the, the vial has it has a two two zero nine five, and you can see up here nine five four number one. Yes. How about the syringe that was found at uh, Defendant Purse House's residence? Did you send that to the FBI to be analyzed? Yes. Okay, and did they return some results for you? I believe they did, yes. Uh, but nothing was found in that syringe? Correct. Of, of value? Correct. And did they return that syringe back to you? Yes. Okay, and did that have to be rebooked into evidence? Yes, it did. Do you want to have it? Uh, Photograph A through F for the property item number 67. May this be marked equals 107? Yes. Looking at photograph A of 107, can you tell us what is shown here? This is um, two envelopes, two analyzed envelopes of LAPD. One is marked with uh, number 67 on the left. Okay. Photograph B. Is this a, some of the contents from that envelope? Yes. It now has an item number two on there, is that correct? Yes, but, huh? but that sticker, that, that's not uh, my doing. That's a sticker that was there after the FBI returned it to you? Yes. Oh. I mean, it was there, it wasn't there when you sent it to him, was it? No. And it was there when you got it back? Yes, sir. Okay. And that sticker has the number of 2020954, number two. 
Yes. Photograph C, is that, is that a close-up of what, what was inside that tube? Yes. And does that appear to be the same syringe with uh, yellow liquid that was sent to the FBI? Yes. Photograph D, is that a close-up of that? Yes. And photograph E, is that a close-up showing the XL brand label on it? Yes. And last thing, photograph F, is that a photograph showing the measurements of how much this uh, syringe may contain? Yes. Now, did you conduct interviews in this case? I did. Did you interview Michael Herman, who was there at the residence on February 15, 2020? Yes, I did. Now, this is important. Your first initial interview with Michael Herman, was it recorded? On Officer Body Warren. Okay. How about you, when you first, did you later on separately interview him? Yes. Did you videotape that interview? Yes. <laughs> Did you interview Sarah Rollins on February 16, 2020, the very next day? Yes. Did you record that initial interview? Yes, I did. And why is that important to record that initial interview? Well, we want to capture uh, what the person, the witness, or whoever it may be, what they say in their words, um, so there's no ambiguity as to what they said. We can always refer back to the uh, recording and see what exactly was said. Now, just going back to February 15, 2020, after all this evidence is collected, uh, were you able to collect uh, the ring videos on February 15, 2020? Yes. So on February 15, 2020, at about what time did you get to see the ring videos from the neighbor's house? Well, he said, what time did you get to see it? That's not how, how, with the foundation part of it. Did he, did he personally collect Yeah, did, did you go there? I did not personally collect the uh, video. Other detectives did. Wait, I'm not asking that. Oh, your question was? I'm not asking. Did you see the, some ring videos from the neighbor's house at some point on February 15, 2020? And his, his, his objection was foundation. And that how, how does he know it was from the neighbor's house okay. being collected? Uh, was that your? Yes, exactly. Well. As the investigating officer on this case, was uh, evidence provided to you? Yes. And did you have detectives obtain the ring videos from the neighbor's house? Objection hearsay foundation. Oh, rule. You can answer that. Yes. Okay, and so that was provided to you? Yes. And did you get to see the ring videos? Yes. At about what time on February 15, 2020, did you get to see the ring videos? Approximately. Sometime uh, mid midday. What, what does midday mean, like 12 p.m.? So somewhere between, let's say, uh, 11 and 1. Uh, 1 p.m.? 1 p.m., yes, sir. And did you have uh, the defendant's DMV photo at that time? No. At that time, had you interviewed Michael Herman? Yes. And had Michael Herman, had he directed you and indicated that you should look into a particular individual? Objection hearsay. Well, it, it isn't hearsay because it only if it's not hearsay if did you undertake s subsequent conduct once Mr. Herman gave you that uh, advice? Yes. Okay, it's not hearsay. Overruled. And did that uh, assist you in in looking into particular su uh, suspects? Yes. And which suspect was that? Gareth Pursehouse. And so. Uh, were you able to look at the body worn video uh, where Michael Herman makes statements there at the location when police officers first arrived? Yes. And you also interviewed him uh, at the scene at 2086 Mount Street on February 15, 2020? Yes. And then was he taken to the police station? To Hollywood Station for a further interview, yes. And was that interview, that first interview with him conducted at 825 in the morning? Yes. And was that videotaped? Yes, it was. Did you also have photographs taken of his injuries? Yes, we did. I did. And did he have uh, uh, some injuries to his body? Yes, he did.
during your interview at 825 in the morning. During that interview, did Mr. Michael Herman uh, indicate to you that his roommate was attacked, that she was screaming, that she was thrown to the ground? Yes. Objection to hearsay. Prior consistent, I take yes. it. Yes, all right, over. And did he, did he say that right away towards the beginning of the interview? I believe so, yes. And just to stay with Mr. Michael Herman, did he call you about five days later and leave a voicemail message for you? Yes, he did. And do you remember what he indicated in that voicemail message to you? Basically, yes. What did he say? That he had been uh, thinking about things and thought he had developed some more insight into what had happened. And what, what else did he say in that voicemail message? Um, you didn't memorize the voicemail message? No, I did not. Okay. Uh, would looking at the report help you refresh your recollection? It, it may. May I approach you on it? Yes. Looking at bait stamp page uh, 3490 for council's benefit. Yes, I remember this. Okay, does that help you remember? <clears throat> yes, it does. All right, so what did he say? What, what, what information did he leave on your voicemail five days after? Uh, February 15, 2020. That he uh, remembered uh, being awakened by the sound of something crashing or breaking, and that um, he remembered that now. All right, we're going to go ahead and take a break, uh, ladies and gentlemen, at this time. Be back at 140, not 130, please. We'll see you. Have a good lunch. Thank you. on the record. Once again, it seems like I'm always apologizing to you, but the, the, this issue had to be resolved before we can continue with this witness. It had to be, and we, we, I resolved it. Uh, any of it. Um, uh, the other thing is that um, you may have noticed that next door, there is going to be a, they close the streets. There's going to be some celebration. They've advised us to stop early because the traffic is going to get horrendous. And so, yeah, it's going to get, it's going to get pretty bad. Uh, the car again and so forth. They're going to start bringing in more things. So my intention is to stop about 3.15. So will you finish with this witness or maybe not? Yeah, yes. Okay. So, okay, so all of you? So I would rush to your cars and get out of town if I literally, <laughs> okay? All right. So, uh, yeah, so if you could stand up again, um, officer. Good. Is it officer or detective? Uh, I'm currently an investigator now. Investigator. Yes. Are you investigator? Okay. David, let's do this in front of the jury if you would. You saw these days that the testimony you're about to give and cause not pending before this court should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you I do. Thank you. Please have a seat. Please state and stop. What's your first and last name? Luis Tapete, L U I S T O P E T E. Okay, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. What is your current occupation? I'm currently an investigator with the Riverside County District Attorney's Office. Uh, what was your occupation back on December 8th of 2021? 
I was a detective with the Los Angeles Police Department, uh, assigned to the computer forensic uh, section. What is your background, training, and experience in regards to forensic examination of electronic devices? Uh, in my in my assignment at the time, I was also assigned to the Secret Service uh, Cyber Fraud Task Force, where I received uh, um, over, I would say, about a thousand hours of training in uh, mobile devices, various operating systems, including Android, uh, iPhone, uh, multiple um, operating systems for computers, whether it's Windows or Apple or Linux uh, systems. So, uh, but I was also certified on examining those devices. Um, both by the uh, uh, Secret Service uh, training facilities and also by some of the uh, private uh, software companies where we actually receive training. Now, back on December 8, 2021, did you receive several electronic devices to examine uh, that were booked under DR number 2006-06220? Uh, yes, I did. Were one of these items, item number 16, a silver stone desktop computer with a serial number of BQ1520464? Uh, yes, it was. Is this item a desktop computer? It is. It was a rather large uh, desktop computer. Was this desktop computer configured in such a way that you'd typically find a desktop computer if you bought it at the store? Objection needing relevance. Uh, it's, it's foundational. Uh, and and uh, relevancy, uh, you're, you're hitting that part uh, very close. So just ask this question and move on if you would. Yes. Uh, I definitely found it to be modified and very, uh, uh, very not very typical of what you might find at a retail store. Objection. Maybe approach. No, no more approaching. Not, not, not for a little while. My legs hurt. Discovered violation. No. Uh, then, uh, no. Relevance. No. Uh, relevance. I'm, I'll allow the answer to stand. Let's move on, as I stated. Sure. Do you remember conducting a forensic analysis? I'm sorry, not do you remember. Did you conduct a forensic analysis of item number 16, that desktop computer? Uh, yes, I did. Now, in conducting that analysis, did you utilize um, keywords uh, in order to conduct that forensic analysis? Yes, I was provided uh, several keyword search terms by the investigator who requested the, uh, the, uh, the search and the analysis. Was one of those search terms Amy Harwick? Uh, yes, it was. Why do you use search terms in order to conduct a forensic analysis of any sort of electronic device? Well, because of the uh, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of files and images that, that are going to be on the computer device, a keyword search term will help me narrow down the results to a manageable amount. Utilizing the search term Amy Harwick, what did you locate on item number 16, the desktop computer? I located a what we would call a, a registry file, which is kind of like a setting file, uh, which tracks um, folders and files and, and user preferences, and that had an artifact with the, with the um, um, with a reference to the Gmail account belonging to the victim. Now, was that Gmail account Amy Nicole 13 at gmail.com? Uh, yes, it was. All right, now that, this time I'll ask you to approach it. Some artifacts belonging to a Gmail account of amynicole13 at gmail.com. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, at this time, Rona, the people would like to mark um, what appears to be a screenshot of a uh, interface of 
the computer, may that be marked as PP6 order? 108. With defense's ongoing objection. Yes, noted. Based on what you stated. Yes. Yes. Because it's all a big document, I'm going to scan it from left to right. Showing you what's been marked as people's 108. Do you recognize this document? Uh, yes, I do. And how do you recognize it? Uh, this would have been one of the reports um, that I generated after the examination. And this is utilizing a program that you use to conduct a forensic analysis? That's correct, for Windows uh, operating systems, yes. Now I'm going to zoom in on a specific entry here. The first entry in this report where it states poor phone Amy, Amy Nicole 13 at gmail.com takeout. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Could you explain to us what that is? Yes, yeah, so so a takeout is is a service that Google offers to back up your um, your Gmail account and all its contents, whether it's email, photos, documents, whatever you keep on your on your Google Drive. So that's a method of backing up your data from Google. Now just to be clear, this artifact is a file that was actually on the user's computer. It was not on the computer. This is a reference to to where it was at. It was actually in a my based on where I'm finding this, this was on some kind of a network attached storage device or um, that the computer had access to. But the computer item number sixteen accessed or viewed this takeout file. Um, is that correct? Yes, that would be correct. Can you tell from uh, your forensic analysis when it was last accessed? So it looks like from the date here, the, they call it the interaction date here, it would have been accessed uh, September 25th, 2019. And that's here where I'm pointing with my pen? Yes. Now, in regards to the several other um, entries here, are those consistent with the first entries? Well, access to a file um, or I'm sorry, that, that this computer accessed that file? Yes, they're all uh, indicating that file or data that's coming out of that file. Now, going down to <coughs> entry seven and eight, you see that there is an access date here of November 26, 2019. Yes. And it appears to be the same file except for the change of words. One says docs and one says contacts. Could you explain the difference? Yes, that's correct. So the Google takeout file is, is like a big zip file and it contains different types of data, documents, contacts, your uh, Gmail contacts would be on there. Uh, whatever the, the user decided, decided to back up and make a copy of. Um, so I'm assuming these all came from the Google takeout file. Now, just to be clear, this labeling here where it says for phone, consistent with all the entries in your report here, is that a label given by the user? Yes, that would have had to have been created by, by the user of this device. Now, you don't know when that label was created, but the label, nonetheless, was created by the user. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Fran Franzel. Thank you. Um, so n none of these uh, digital for pieces of digital forensic evidence in any way suggest that somebody was accessing this Amy Nicole thirteen at gmail dot com account on those dates. That's not what this stands for. Uh, overruled, I mean, based on what the court has ruled in terms of, you mean actually going into her account? Correct. I'll allow it as such, based on the court's ruling. Earlier. Is, he, is counsel opening the door? No, no, no. This, this I, is, I, I, that's, this that's fair, court. based on the court's ruling. You can answer that question, but don't go delve deep into it. Yes. No, I'm not. Right, so again, this is simply saying that a, a backup of the Gmail account was done, and the, this computer accessed access data from that Google takeout or Google takeout file. Okay. And just so that it's super crystal clear, access means. Okay. Well, let him finish. Okay. Sorry, I, uh, Go ahead. just to be very clear, uh, access means um, going to a file and opening the file and viewing the file. Yes. Okay. 
Okay. You, there, there was, in your review of item 16, this computer, uh, there was no evidence uh, that told you when this Google takeout occurred of amynicole13 at gmail.com. When the backup occurred of the Google? Correct. Right, I wasn't able to determine that because okay. I didn't have the device where the, the actual file was residing in. Uh, for all you know, it could be 2010. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't uh, have the date, right. I didn't know what the date was. And uh, you do not know when the folder was named. Uh, this, and we're looking at, you know, a any of these. Uh, this is the same. Basically, it's the same path. But you don't know when you don't know when that or phone path name was created, right? Right. I don't know. Now. Um, Did you at any point discuss uh, your interpretations of this very technical information with Mr. Avila or Ms. Mariano and kind of explain what it all means? Um, again, be careful of tread lightly based on the court's ruling if uh, you get a response of some sort. So it's just I'm, I'm I understand, but we don't know what conversation took place. You, nor do you not, I'm not asking about the content of the conversation. Just did, it, okay. did any conversation occur where like facts about your work were discussed? Uh, yes, I discussed my findings about this file. Do you recall when? Uh, that would have been a few hours ago. Uh, where was that? Uh, at the district attorney's office uh, in the Hall of Justice. How long was that conversation, R roughly? Uh, maybe 10 minutes. And last question, um, similar to you not knowing the, the date uh, of the backup, you also don't know the circumstances around that, do you? Circumstances? Like, you don't know uh, how it happened. I can't say for sure how, how it was backed up. I can only speculate. All right. Nothing for you. Anything? No, you Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. John. Hey, Carrie, next with us. We're going to recall uh, Scott, Detective Scott, Matt, retired Detective Scott. Is, what does this make us fifth time up here? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Detective. Matt. William Masterson, Scott to his friends. No. <laughs> you got a good workout, huh? Getting a lot of seat time yeah. out in the hallway. You were still inquiring, weren't you? Uh, yes. All right. I was saying, uh, let me have to take a seat. Uh, we were talking about Michael Herman and the first statements he had made during your interviews. Uh, and we talked about how he left a voicemail message for you. Yes. And, and you read it, and you indicated that in that voicemail message, he said, he had heard crashing sound like someone dropping a plate earlier in the evening? Yes. And then did you then try to meet with him that same day, February 20th, 2020, to interview him? Yes. And did you interview him? Yes. And the second interview, did you record it? Yes. And in the second interview, did he say, right when, at the beginning of the interview, uh, I think because when I yelled up her name, uh -huh, I think I think he put her to the ground as quickly as he could and started choking her. Yes. And and did you do did you or Detective Carranza ask? Wait a minute, you heard choking? Yes, I heard choking. Did he say that? Yes. And did he also say uh, it sounded like it sounded like it sounded like he threw her to the floor and then she screamed like choking sound. 
Like it sounded like I figured that she uh, that what it was she was screaming for a while, like really bloody murder. Yes. And did he also say she was screaming? And remember, I told you I thought she saw a mouse or something, and I just woke up. Yes. And did he also say because as soon as soon as I said her name, he started manhandling? Yes. And that was uh, on February 20th, 2020. Yes. By the way, uh, now going back to the date of the murder, the date uh, that Amy Harwick was killed, February 15th, 2020, did you speak to a Robert Koshlin? No, I would object to the form of the question in reference to murder. All right, the day, that he rephrased. He said I, the day, that, it. yeah, he, he did uh, rephrase after that. So the day of the incident. All right, the date of the incident, February 15th. 2020, uh, did you speak to Robert Koshlin at about 10 in the morning? Yes. Now, did he provide you with the name of uh, Gary Persons? Yes, he did. Uh, Michael Herman, uh, did Michael Herman just tell you you should talk to Robert Koshlin about the actual name of the, of the ex-boyfriend? Yes. And did Robert Koshlin provide you some information that then led you to investigate Gary Persons? Yes. <clears throat> and did you interview Sarah Rollins on February 16, 2020? Yes. And was Robert Koshlin present during that interview? I believe, yes. Okay. Why is that? Why was he present during that interview? That's not typically what we do, but uh, she felt like she needed support. She was nervous, <coughs> upset, so we did it that way. Objection, culture, speculation, hearsay. Well, did she say that, sir? Yeah. I don't remember her exact words, but that was the what I understood from her. That she was he was there for support. Yes. Okay. Court will allow us. And by the way, did you record that initial interview with Sarah Rollins? Yes, I did. By the way. Uh, when did you, do you remember when, approximately when you received the autopsy report for this particular case? It, I, don't, I don't recall the exact date, but it was a, uh, about a month later. Uh, do you have any notes that would tell you when you received it? Uh, I don't know if I have a, a chrono that would cover that time frame. Would it be in April of 2020? Objection. Witness testified he doesn't remember. I didn't remember, so... Well, let, me, let me ask you this. When Michael Herman told you that you heard her being choked, had, did you have the autopsy report at that point? Objection. Ask and answer. I didn't ask. Hey, hey, go ahead. You can answer. No. I did not have the autopsy report. So you didn't... Uh, did the, when you received the autopsy report, the autopsy report indicated manual strangulation? Yes. Objection. Vague of the date. All right. You can just clear that up. At any point, when you had the autopsy report, did the autopsy report indicate that one of the causes, one of the contributing factors to death was uh, manual strangulation? Yes. But your interview with Michael Herman in February 2020, when he said she was being choked, did you have the autopsy report at that point? No, I did not. Cross examination. Let me just have a moment to get set up, Your Honor. All right. Good afternoon, Detective. Good afternoon. Just Scott. I'm the longer detective. All right. Um, so you spoke with Michael Herman at 2086 Mound Street on February 15th, 2020, right? Correct. And you spoke to him before interviewing him at the station? Yes. You went into his house? Went into his bedroom. Right. You walked through the house and down to his bedroom, right? No. I came in through the back door and his bedroom is right there to the right. Okay. He was asleep? Not when I interviewed him, no. <laughs> I should hope not. <laughs> that would be a strange interview. 
uh, when you walked into his room? When I walked into his room, he, he was, was in bed. He was not in bed asleep. He was at, at 2086 Mound when you first went over there in the morning, uh, before the interview at the station. He was in bed. He was under the covers in bed. I don't recall him being under the covers in bed. Would it refresh your recollection to look at a body worn video? It may, yes. the sound off. Did that refresh your recollection? Can, can you rewind that just a little bit, just a few a few seconds back? Like, is that far enough? Or a little bit further? Yeah, no, that's fine. I think that's fine. Thank you. I think Carranza came down and I just came in. Right, oh, there. Okay. All right. Did that refresh your recollection? Somewhat, yes. So, um... There is a uniformed officer with Detective Carranza uh, who arrives at 2086 Mount Street, right? Yes. And that, the uniformed officer is the one that has the body-worn camera that's making the recording. Correct, right? yes. And, off, and Detective Carranza, an officer, walk through the house. Yes. And you, I think, walk around the side and come in the back. That's my, my recollection of it, yes. And then you go into Michael Herman's room, um, and, uh, you know, no one can know if he was, like, actually asleep asleep, but he was under the covers in bed, right? Yes, the video showed he was laying in bed with the blankets, yes. Um, and the three of you uh, wake him up and tell him that you uh, want to do a walkthrough in the house. Objection. Foundation, wake him up. Well, again, no one can know whether he was asleep or not, so okay. anyway, they so make contact with make him. Make contact with him. Right. Yes. Um, and uh, you asked him to tell you everything that had happened, uh, and what he heard and saw, right? Yes. And you asked him, you know, what he did in reaction to what he heard and saw the night before, right? We asked to, to do the walkthrough and to, to get an idea of, the, of what he was going to tell us. Okay. I, I don't know the specific wording that you're giving me there. And um, so you walk through the house and he tells you uh, what had happened. Right? Yes. And in that walkthrough on February 15th, 2020, um, in the morning, he does not tell you that he heard the sound of something breaking earlier in the night. Is that correct? Is that what you're saying? I, no, I don't think so, no. He did not tell you that he heard sounds of choking? No. And just so the record's clear, I don't want. I want to avoid a double negative. So I'll, I'll end my questions with: Is that correct? Okay. So um, he did. He, he did not tell you that he heard the sounds of Amy being muffled. Is that correct? Just double negative. <laughs> muffled? No, the double negative. Double negative. Yeah. Okay. Are you the one you wanted to avoid. I know. I I tried to avoid it, and I set myself up. Go ahead. Right, right into it. Um, it's. Uh, 
he never told you that he heard the sounds of or what sounded like Amy being muffled. Well, he uh, he did tell us that he heard Amy being muffled. The way you asked me that the, question in the in the walkthrough. Okay. Before before you take him to the station, in that walkthrough, he never s- said that he heard what sounded like uh, her being muffled. He never said that. I'm trying. I'm, I'm just trying to remember at what time at what. At what point he said that, and I, I, I think that is correct. Um, he does not tell you that he heard the sounds of what sounded like two people falling to the floor in the initial walkthrough. Correct. Correct. Um, he does not say that he heard sounds of suffocating. Correct. He um, he told you that she was still yelling when he left the house. I believe that is correct. He told you that she was yelling the whole time. My, my only hesitation is that I don't know if... Um, he said that she was yelling the whole time or that when he left to get help, he no longer heard her yelling. That, that's the only thing that I'm... I Would it refresh your recollection to look at the transcript? It may. Um, this, is, this is the transcript um, tied file number walkthrough with detectives and PR. And I'm going to have him read, um, starting in page 27... Uh, line 24 and read to page uh, 28 uh, line 10 and if you could please look up when you're done. Okay. So to line 10 and 27. So if you start at 27 at the very bottom. This goes to 20. Oh, page 27. Line what? Uh, line 21. 21, okay. And then to line 10 of the next page. Okay. I think is the, the relevant part. You're welcome to read more. But. Refresh your recollection, Scott? Somewhat, yes. Uh, so he told you that uh, she was yelling still when he left the house. Yes. And that she was uh, yelling the whole time. Yes. So after that walkthrough, then um, y- you and Detective Carranza and the officer and Mr. Herman go to the station, right? Yes. And you have a more formal interview at the station that occurred at 8.25 in the morning. Yes. Uh, And there you do a more thorough interview and ask him more, um, not just what happened at night, but more facts surrounding the situation, right? Correct. Um, And... You have him run through again uh, the the relevant events. Yes. And he, in that interview on uh, at eight twenty five in the morning on the fifteenth of February, uh, he does not tell you that he heard the sounds of choking. Correct. He does not tell you that he heard the sounds of Amy being muffled. Yes, correct. He does not tell you that he heard the sounds of suffocating. Correct. He does not tell you that it got quiet before he left the house. He does not. He told you that she was still yelling when he left. Yes. Um, he never told you that he heard what sounded like two people falling to the floor. No, I don't believe so. He specifically described it as um, 
like a shuffling sound sounded like a struggle. Right. Yeah, I remember him saying struggle, yes. Um, and that she was yelling the whole time, and she just kept screaming. Yes. And you specifically asked him, uh, did you hear anything else? And he said no. I don't remember that specific question, but that sounds like something I would have asked. This transcript, the page numbers aren't on it, so it's a little bit difficult, but would it refresh your recollection if I showed you uh, in the transcript that question? It might. Okay. Just give me a second, because every page says it's page three, which it's not. Actually, I'm going to just return to that in a second. So the first time that he um, ever said anything to choking or being brought to the floor uh, was on the 20th of, of February, 2020. Yes, I believe that's correct. And that was um, in a phone call initially, right? Yes. Yes. You and Detective Carranza were in a car. Yes. And Michael Herman uh, called you, or either you called him or he called you. Yes. And you had a brief conversation with him, and then you put the phone on speaker. Yes. And you put the phone on speaker so that Detective Carranza could listen um, and be part of the conversation, and also to begin recording. Yes. And so that recording begins once you move from just speaking on the phone to putting it on speaker for the three of you to have a discussion, right? Correct. Um, now, in that phone call on the 20th, that was the first time he told you that he heard choking. I believe so. That was the first time he told you that he heard sounds of what sounded like an, uh, someone taking another person to the ground. Yes. Um, those were new facts that he did not tell you previous to the 20th of February. Yes. And that was the same day that the media published the coroner's findings that, al that alleged strangulation. On, on, on February uh, 20th. 20th. Foundation? If you know. If he knows. Did you ever see that publication? No, sir. Okay, just say. You didn't see the LA Times article? No. All right, so I'd like to talk about uh, the kind of the timeline. So on February 15th, 2020, um, at 4.30 in the morning, Detective Fret Lower calls you. Yes. Um, now, Sergeant Deneen had, had called m much earlier to the night detectives, right? I don't know. Um, it was assigned to you as a case to respond to. There were multiple detectives that were available that night, right? I, I was the on-call detective. Okay. Um, but the call, uh, the call to the night detectives had, had happened uh, like two and a half hours before you got the call at 4.30, right? I don't know. And uh, the interior crime scene you testified to on direct wasn't established until 5 a.m., right? Or sorry, crime scene log. The interior crime scene log? Correct. I think that's what time they started, yes. On that day, you took handwritten notes about going to the crime scene. Yes. Or the, the suspected crime scene at the time, right? Yes. Um, and...
According to those handwritten notes, you arrive at 2086 Mound Street at 5.50 in the morning. My handwritten notes? Correct. I don't recall. Would it refresh your recollection? It might. Um, if you could just look at those, the top part of the page and look up when you're done. Did that refresh your recollection? Not really. Um, you took these handwritten notes on the 15th of February, 2020, right? Yes. Uh, you listed the incident number, right? Yes. Uh, the RD number, what's that? Reporting district. Uh, the report time, right? Yes. And then some basic information, the, the names of the paramedics who responded. It's relevance. It's just there. Okay. It's going, yeah. And you indicated that you arrived at 5.50 in the morning, right? Yeah, that's what the notes say, yes. You took you kept a chronicle, chronological log of your investigative actions in this case, right? Yes. Um, and in that, it's chrono for short, um, it, it shows the date and time of what you did, uh, you know, significant act, investigation act, actions that you took, right? Yes, that's the purpose of the chronological record. And in the chrono, it lists you arriving at 545, right? I don't know for certain. Would it refresh your recollection to look at the chrono? It might. May I approach? Yes. If you could look at uh, row three on the first page. This one? Um, oh, yeah, this one. Second. Second. Okay. Did that refresh your recollection? As to the time? Yes. Not really. But it does It does say on your chrono that you arrived at 545, right? It, the chrono shows 545, yes. Um, but on the interior crime scene log, it says you arrived at 5, no, right? I have to ask the answer to relevance. This is the same. And relevancy as well. And now, detectives don't wear body-worn video, right? No. You, at least when I was employed. And you weren't in this case? And I did not in this case, no. You wrote a, a, number, a number of reports uh, in the days Im immediately after February 15th, right? You mean involving other incidents? No, in this case. He, right. he wrote a six-page investigative report in this case. Do you, do you recall that? I, w I wrote several reports, yes. I'm just talking about the days right after. I'm just like the, the days immediately after the incident. You, you wrote a report on the 16th of February, 2020, titled Investigative Report, right? I may have. Would it refresh your recollection to look at it? It might. Okay. And while I'm up here, if I may, well, let me ask you first. Do you recall writing the closeout report? Yes. Okay. Vegas, the closeout report. Is that what it's entitled? It is. All right. Um, so this, let's take the investigative report first. You, fi you finalized it on the 16th of February, right? That is the, the first re the report that you showed me. Okay. So that is the uh, initial report that we write, the crime report. It, right. My question is, you finalized that on the 16th of February, right? I don't understand what you mean by finalized. You wrote it on the 16th of February. Yeah, again, I don't remember the exact date that I wrote that. Go to refresh our recollection. All right, let's approach. I did 
Okay. All right, go. Okay, so I just want to just quickly establish that uh, you wrote a, an investigative report on the 16th, right? Just I, the basic crime report. The that basic crime report. I don't know if it was the 16th or the 17th, but yes, I wrote that report. And then you wrote a closeout report uh, on the 17th. Again, I don't, I don't know the exact date. But you did write a closeout report. I did. Report. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, I think, I mean, I think it's important to just establish the date. Um, would it refresh your... I'll move on. It's fine. Um, so you... Uh, uh, miss... Well, br very, very briefly. It's incredibly... You, you're retired. You have a ton of experience. It, it's incredibly important to include all of, the, all of the significant facts in your investigative report, right? I'm going to check this argument of incredibly... Important. Well, I, 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 I think I know what the question is, as you asked it. It's important that you include significant material facts in your report, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and the closeout report specifically gets sent to uh, district attorneys who are going to make a decision on you know, what charge to file and what to do in, reaction, in response to your investigation. Right? I send all my reports to the district attorney's office. Including that one? Including that one. Okay. Okay, good. They're going to make a decision based on this closeout, and a closeout is uh, a initial summary of what you believe the facts to be at that point in time. Well, it's well, relevant yeah, to the speculation. Well, yeah, it is speculative. He sends all the reports. What they what they make a decision on, as opposed to just that report. I think they make it. You, you, you can't answer the question whether it's a culmination of all the reports as opposed to just the closeout report. But based on all the information they send. Then you're probably correct. They they decide whether what if any charges are going to file. And you would and you would want to put all of the important facts in your reports to, to provide to the prosecution, right? Yes. Um, and your reports in this case were complete, true, and accurate. To the best of my ability, yes. Miss Harwick was pronounced dead at three twenty six a.m. on the fifteenth of, fe of February, right? I believe so. And when you arrived. Um, at 2086 Mound, you were aware that she had passed? Yes. Um, upon arrival, each detective checked in with Officer Garcia, who maintained the crime scene lock. Right? Well, relevant to so the this is <clears throat> The prosecution, Mr. Avila asked about the crime scene lock specifically on direct. I mean, it won't be, but I'm um, sustaining objection. All right, so uh, paramedics had moved things in the patio area when they arrived, prior to you, right? Foundation. Do you know, sir? I, I don't know. Okay. It was all done before I was there. Sustained. Whatever was done. You don't know if paramedics like moved the, the, the patio furniture? He, he doesn't know, counsel. If it was moved, he can't say whether they're paramedics or police officers that did it. Do you know? Uh, no. Okay. You didn't review body worn of the responding officers? I did. Well, I would object as to the point of the question. All right. Ask your next question, Kevin. So the point is, you don't know exactly what was moved and how in the uh, prior to your arrival. Correct. You interviewed Robert Koshlin on the 15th of February, 2020 at 10 a.m. Yes. He told you about Ms. Harwick's Google Nest cameras in this interview. Yes. Um, I have a number of photographs that I'd like to introduce that I previously marked, or actually I marked the numbers, but what's the next in order? You, you, you. I didn't want to say double U because it sounds like the letter, so it's U, a U. Okay, th it's uh, 13 photographs. That, I, that I'd okay. like to be marked as one through thirteen. U U one through thirteen. Um, showing them to the prosecution. Yeah, that's all. Nothing. It's from. It's there. 
Can you just please uh, briefly look through these and just look up when you when you're done? seen that photo before. All right. So did you recognize all of those photos? Yes. And these are photos that were taken um, on the 15th of yes. February. All right. So publishing UU13. So this is a picture of the balcony that's off of Ms. Harwood's bedroom, right? Yes. This is UU12. Uh, this is just the other side of the balcony, right? Yes. UU11. This is um, the left side of the balcony looking down towards the patio. Yes. UU10. Um, also at the left corner uh, looking down at the patio. Yes. From the balcony, right? From the balcony, yes, sir. And it, there's some foliage, right? There's some leaves from the tree right there? Yes. And the the tree, the branch and the leaves actually kind of come through the railing a bit, right? It looks like it comes to the railing, yes. UU9. Uh, this is just an, also from the next corner, right? Yes. U U A. Uh, this is a different angle of the railing, right? Of the railing, the left side railing, yes. U mm -hmm. seven. Uh, same corner, but just a different angle, backed up a little bit, and there you can see some of the the branches and foliage coming through the. Uh, Ram, right? Yes. UU6. Uh, just a different angle, same balcony, right? Yes. UU5. That's the right corner. Yes. UU4. Also right corner. Yes. U three middle. Yes. U two. Um, and that's the left corner again. Yes. And U one is the view of the balcony from the bedroom. <coughs> yes, through the front doors. Yes. Mr. Pursehouse was arrested on the 15th of February, 2020, right? Yes. And he posted bail? Yes. And on the 19th, you and Detective Carranza met with Mr. Avila and another attorney, right? On the 19th of February? Yes. And the prosecution filed the case, right? Yes. And a court order was obtained authorizing Church bail? Church of Relevance found in 352. Well, it's just, it's just 
I haven't even asked my question. But uh, you have an order was obtained for his arrest. Is that what we're here? Authorizing the bail bonds company to provide GPS tracking. Okay, sustained. All right. He was arrested on the 19th again, right? Yes, he was rearrested, yes. And when he was rearrested, he was be being detained at a location by the bail bond agent. Protection relevance? Sustained. Um, on direct, you testified that the diameter of what you believe to be urine was three feet uh, w wide. Yes, I did say that on direct. Okay. Now, nowhere in your notes does it say anything that it was that large, right? I don't think so. Nowhere in your investigative report does it say that it was three feet in diameter, right? I don't believe so. Nowhere in your closeout report does it say that it was three feet in diameter. Objection has been answered. Well, he's referencing different reports. Did you indicate that anywhere in any report that you may have generated? No, I don't believe okay. I did. So your testimony today was the first time that this fact had been uh, uttered. I may have opined that position previously. Um, on direct, you testified that at 127 the on the night of the February 15th that the exterior uh, crime scene log was created yes um, and you testified on direct that it was because there had been a homicide yes but she ha wasn't pronounced deceased until three I think Object 26 argumentative, argumentative. Uh, overruled. Uh. Oh, so she hadn't been. She had she, not been pronounced dead. So yet. she was still alive at one. Uh, but the, the law was. But the law was created at one twenty-seven. Yes. You can create a log for whatever you want to create a log for. It doesn't necessarily have to be because of a homicide. Well, I'm only asking you about that because on direct you said that it, it was created because there had been a homicide. But okay. there hadn't been a homicide at that point in time. I'm going to testimony. Does, does that mistake what you stated? Yes. Okay. Stated. Um, you completed and submitted a request for serology and DNA analysis on the 16th of February at 8 in the morning, right? Yes. Um, and... You requested that the substance in the syringe be tested, right? Yes. So generally speaking, when investigating a uh, potential homicide, if you want different kinds of testing done on physical evidence, you can ask the Forensic Science Division uh, to run a wide variety of tests, right? Take us to what type of evidence? Well, he's talking in general terms. Are yes. you talking about blood, or what are you talking about? In general terms... As a, yeah, I think my question was clear. Well, was it for blood or was it for, in this case, syringe? It's a, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'll ask it again. Okay. Generally speaking, when investigating a homicide, if you want different kinds of testing done on physical evidence, you can ask the Forensic Science Division to run a variety of tests. Vegas to different types of testing, different materials. Can you can you dictate what tests should be run, whether fingerprints or serology or anything like that? Yes, yeah, so I, I would make a request. Okay. For for whatever it is I'm I'm looking for. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, that's all I'm trying to. Okay, we got there. <laughs> uh, and if and if they can't do it, uh, then they can contract with other agencies to perform the test. Typically, right? Check your foundation. Sustain. He can order the test. He doesn't know what, what they're able to do with it after that. Who makes that decision? Well, no, if, if, if he says, yeah. like ask in this case. Ask like him. Him. Go in, ahead. In ask this him. case, uh, let's do an as applied. In this case, um, the forensic science division's test of the substance in the syringe showed, uh, a pr the preliminary test showed possible nicotine, right? Do you know that? I, I don't think that's correct. Is it, do, do you know that well, at all? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Your Honor. 
Well, I, I made a, I made the request to find out what the substance was in the syringe. Right, and, and then it, they ran it. Let him finish. Let him finish. And then it, it came back uh, non-narcotic, and then I believe there was a line that said possibly nicotine. Right. It, okay. the, the report said no controlled substances, right? No narco, I believe is the way they phrased it. No narco. All right. Like, there's, there are controlled substances that are controlled by the DEA. I don't they know about the DEA. All right, but counsel, let, let's move on. Okay. Uh, but in that report, there was also uh, paperwork that showed that there was a test that showed the possibility that there was nicotine, right? I would just say that in the, in the lab report that I got back, it did have a line about uh, nicotine. Okay. And so in, in this applied situation, um, the, for, the Forensic Science Division wasn't able to then run the confirmatory test, right? To Cor- foundation. Uh, all right, he was. Were you going to say correct? I was. Okay, so he says correct. What's your next question? Well, and Mr. Avila asked a, an entire line of questioning about sending it to the FBI and and oh, no, the no, lab. S- 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 sustain. So go ahead. And ask, ask, it. ask your next question. Okay, so he says correct. Go ahead. And so, because the LAPD couldn't do that final confirmatory test, then you made the decision to send the syringe to the FBI for them to do it, right? Yes. So what I'm trying to get at is that the type of test that you run depend on the evidence. It's a case-by-case situation, right? Petition day. Yes, yeah, it's sustained. I mean, are you talking about the type? That's unclear uh, whether it's the type of test that you run versus the type of test a lab is capable of running. In this case, the lab was incapable of running a nicotine test, so I'm not sure... Uh, how you're, which, where you're, where you're going with it, so. Well, and then the detective had to make a decision. Okay, what do I do? We, we the, the, they couldn't confirm the nicotine. So right, he, he said it's the FBI. Right. right, right. And so, that's an example of how. Well, I'm gonna have to let him finish, let him finish, go ahead. That's an example of how, um, it, in a case-by-case situation, you have to decide, as one of the investigating detectives, um, you know what to do and and how to solve these problems. Right? Again, under 352, in this case, he decided to refer to the FBI. Whether what happens in other cases, uh, it's it's not relevant to this case. But suffice it to say that he made a decision to refer to the FBI. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, let's move on. Um, you had the uh, syringe swab for DNA. Yes. On the 24th of September, 2020, uh, you transferred items 42, or item 42, uh, Ms. Harwick's laptop computer to the Cyber Crimes Division. Is that correct? I don't know if I did that or my partner did that, but it was done. Okay, may I, would it refresh your recollection to look at the document showing the transfer? Sure. You could just briefly review the document and look up when you're done. Did that refresh your recollection? Uh, not completely, but I see my signature on the checkout there. And um, you transferred the a number of items, but I'm only really asking you about item 42, which is a laptop. Um, and you transferred it uh, and you signed the piece of paper that you were the one transferring it, right? Checking it out of property, yes. I'm sorry, sometimes I'm not really clear of, on your question, by the way, the, the terminology that you're using. Transfer, did, if you're asking, did I physically move that computer from point A to point B? Or did I initiate getting this computer out of our property so it could be moved? So I, you know, I, I did. I, I checked it out, yes, but I don't recall that I'm the one that physically took it from LAPD custody to wherever it went to. You didn't like walk the laptop over physically, right? Correct. 
Okay, I, the word, I use the word transfer because this document's called transfer list. Correct. Right? Um, and transferring a, a piece of evidence from one location to another, it's important to establish chain of custody, right? Correct. Um, Ms. Bernstein Lev and an investigator from the Public Defender's Office requested to view and photograph pieces of evidence, right? That were, had been booked, right? Do you recall that? I believe so. And then uh, you made various pieces of evidence available to them, right? Okay, yes. And you were present when they photographed that evidence, right? I don't have a real clear recollection of, of that event, I'm sorry. You don't recall Miss Bernstein Love and a, and a big guy, an uh, investigator, coming by and taking photographs of pieces of evidence? I, I don't have a real clear recollection of that, I don't. I'm not, I'm not saying it didn't happen, I'm just saying I don't have a, a real clear recollection of that event three years ago or whatever it was. Um, you learned in the investigation in this case that Ms. Harbrick had these Google Nest security cameras inside I'm of her home. Check foundation. Well, well, I'll withdraw it. I'll okay, withdraw. all right. You can answer. Yes. Um, and you learn the location of, of those cameras as part of your investigation, right? Yes. Um, and did you document the location of the cameras? I don't believe I did. Okay. There were, there was one in the living room, right? I remember that one, yes. One in the kitchen, right? I don't remember. Uh, one upstairs. I don't remember. And um, Miss Miss Harwick's housemate, Michael Herman, told you that they existed, right? Yes. And that they collected audio and video, right? No, yep. just a hearsay, unless it's for impeachment or something. It, 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 a piece of communication was provided to him that then affected what he did afterwards. Did you do anything because of what Mr. Herman told you? I mean, I take it that after he told you that, you, you tried to secure the camera footage or whatever? Yes. Okay, I'll log. And <clears throat> similarly, um, Robert Caution told you that you needed to get the footage from the cameras, right? Yes. And the first responding officers told you that they had seen notifications on her phone from her Google Nest account. Right? First responding officers? The, you, officers, you who sh the officers who, who first arrived at 2086 communicated to you that they had seen these notifications on her phone that from Google Maps. I don't, I don't recall that. Um, what's the next in order, Your Honor? You are at uh, W. I'm assuming. Double V. Or wait, is it double W? Oh, wait, no, double it's V. Okay. I'm excited for double W. You're excited for that? <laughs> it's BB. It's um, all right, so uh, this is just a single photograph publishing VV. Um, now, zooming in, is that circle, that black looking circle in the corner um, of the living room, the, one of the Google Nest cameras? Yes. Uh, you're familiar with a preservation request, right? Yes. And a preservation letter requires organizations like Google to preserve copies of records um, pending the legal process, like search warrants, right? Yes. And this is, there's actually a federal law requiring these companies to comply, right? I'm not familiar with the federal law. And you personally did not send Google a preservation request, right? No, I did not. To your knowledge, no one who was investigating the case sent Google a preservation request? I don't know. Let me ask you, counsel, just for housekeeping purposes, uh, what, how much longer do you have? I, I, I'm not going to finish I, in the next you know, five or ten minutes. Okay. Can you finish in ten minutes? No. Well, how much longer do you have to need? Um, I th honestly, I think probably that at this pace, I think a half hour, 40 minutes. Okay. We're not going to finish. 
and your witness has to be here, unfortunately, for Mr. Masterson. I think he's going to have to talk with me later. Sorry. I apologize for that. Where, where, were, you, where were you headed back? Tennessee. Oh. I'm sorry. Um, that's not going to happen. Uh, they're not going to finish in time. So you want it back at 9.30 on Monday? Uh, yes. Apologies. Yeah. Sorry, sir. I understand. Okay. You, you are excused. You can, you can. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, have a safe weekend. Uh, try to stay healthy. We'll see you on Monday at 9.30.